Before we introduce our guest speakers today, I'm going to take a few minutes to provide some context for today's discussion, which will focus around the Alzheimer's Society of BC's lived experience partner program. So our vision, again, is a world without Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, and that world begins with a society where people affected by dementia are welcomed, supported, and included. And to realize that vision, we need to move away from denial and fear of illness and move towards awareness and understanding. So when we reduce stigma and build dementia-friendly environments, as well as volunteer opportunities, we're creating a world where people affected by dementia can live better and remain socially engaged. And we believe one of the most powerful ways to break down the stereotypes that still exist around dementia is to hear directly from people with lived experience of the disease. So what does it mean to have lived experience? Having lived experience means a person has been directly affected by dementia. So they're either a person living with the disease or supporting someone as a family caregiver or friend. And people living with dementia and those supporting them have experienced firsthand the cognitive and emotional changes, as well as the impact that dementia can have on daily life, relationships, and one's overall well being. We believe that each person brings a unique perspective and understanding of the dementia journey. And we're here to elevate more lived experience voices. And the Alzheimer's Society of BC is committed to ensuring that the voices of lived experience um, and those that support them are at the forefront of everything that we're doing. So why is meaningful engagement so important? Um, for us here at the Alzheimer's Society, it's critical that people living with dementia and caregivers have opportunities to purposely participate in a way that recognizes their unique perspectives, their experiences, and their abilities. And so there's many reasons why we believe it's important. Um, meaningful engagement opportunities are important. And first and foremost, that is because people living with dementia have rights and they're entitled to be included in the decision-making process, particularly when those decisions impact them directly. And we want to hear a perspectives that otherwise wouldn't be understood, um, hearing firsthand per people's personal experiences and to reduce the stigma and discrimination by breaking down some of those stereotypes that exist. And we want to ensure that dementia supports practices and policies are informed by a range of experiences and address what matters most to people affected by dementia. And we also want to offer as many opportunities as possible for skills development and empowerment and to help people find a purpose um, in advocacy and other avenues. So, if you take anything away from this presentation, we hope that you take away that the diagnosis of dementia does not mean the end of a meaningful life. There are many ways uh, for people with lived experience to get involved in a way that brings purpose and meaning to them. So to provide a little bit of background about how we got to where we are today in, in regards to our lived experience program, in uh, 2021, the Alzheimer's Society of BC first established the Committee for Meaningful Engagement of People with Lived Experience. And this committee is made up of interdepartmental group of staff and people with lived experience of dementia. So we're committed to providing meaningful engagement opportunities that go beyond consulting to collaborating and co-creating and hope to truly cultivate true partnerships. So one of the committee's primary objectives was creating a lived experience framework guide, which is now available. And the guide underlines the society's commitment to the meaningful engagement of people with lived experience of dementia and really sets the foundation for our lived experience partner program, which we're happy to talk a little bit more about today. And in the development of this guide, we did conduct focus groups to engage with several family caregivers and people living with dementia to ensure that what matters most to people with lived experience was represented throughout. If you'd like to uh, download a copy of the framework guide or view it, you can do so by visiting alzbc.org slash lived experience. And then I also just want people to be aware uh, that in late 2023, we launched uh, phase one of the lived experience webpage. So it is titled partnering with people with lived experience and you'll find that page under the take action heading on the Alzheimer's Society of BC's homepage. It has two tabs. So first you'll see partnering with people with lived experience, which is where you'll find the framework guide and other information about meaningful engagement. 
And then we have a second tab called engagement opportunities. And this is where we're highlighting the opportunities available for lived experience partners. And this tab also includes information on how you can connect with the society uh, to learn more about this program with a simple uh, link to an online application where you can share your information with us and then we'll reach out to you directly. Um, we are planning to launch phase two of the lived experience webpage later this year, which will focus on celebrating some of the achievements and stories of our lived experience partners. And so we encourage you to check out the page following the webinar and invite you to fill out the online application if you'd like to learn more about how you can become a lived experience partner, or if you just have questions uh, about how you can get engaged with the society, and then continue to check uh, in at that page because we're going to be putting a lot more of our um, partnerships and celebrating people's stories throughout the year. Okay, so this is uh, what brings us here today really is to celebrate the launch of the new lived experience partner program, which is uh, one that I'm very excited to announce and as part of this program, we will be offering a range of short and long term opportunities available for people living with dementia and those that support them. So we're going to work with each of our lived experience partners to find engagement opportunities that are meaningful and personalized to their unique skills and their abilities. And that includes an orientation to the role, opportunities for training and skills development as people want. Uh, the more they want to get involved, the more opportunities that we'll be able to provide. Um, and each partnership will look a little bit different dependent on one's interests, experience, uh, requested support and availability. So there's lots of flexibility built into this program. Um, I'll just highlight a few ways that people can get involved. So people may participate in focus groups. They may share their personal experiences and perspectives in things like interviews, panel discussions, webinars, or through other public forums, support education development. You can get involved in legislative outreach or support our research team. People may also wish to not have a public facing role. So there's opportunities to work behind the scenes in an advisory role or as a committee representative. And also excited to announce that we're going to be having an artist in residence um, opportunity where we'll provide a platform for people who are looking for uh, a creative way to share uh, their journey or just their artistic endeavors. And that's just to name a few of the things that we're offering currently. Our goal is truly to continue to grow the program. And so at this time, I am delighted to introduce our guest speakers, um, each of whom have dedicated their time to supporting others affected by dementia and have supported the work of the Alzheimer's Society of BC. So first I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Jim Mann. Jim is a retired marketing and communications professional from Surrey who has been a longtime supporter and volunteer with the Alzheimer's Society of BC. Currently, he is sitting on our board of directors and the Alzheimer's Society of BC's Committee for Meaningful Engagement of People with Lived Experience. Jim was first diagnosed with young onset dementia at the age of 58 and has been on a mission to make life better for others affected by dementia ever since. So big welcome to you, Jim. And I'd also like to introduce Granville Johnson. So Granville is a two tour Vietnamese Vietnam veteran, artist, musician, and author, and he was diagnosed with vascular dementia in 2011. Instead of letting his diagnosis define him, he turned to art and music to become an advocate for the dementia community. So welcome, Granville. I'm also pleased to introduce Jerry Hinton. So Jerry is a passionate advocate for those living with dementia, driven by her experiences as a caregiver for her husband, Peter. Upon Peter's diagnosis, Jerry retired to care for him, keeping him at home for as long as possible. After Peter's transition to long-term care, Jerry remained a constant source of support. Since Peter's passing in 2008, she has become a fierce advocate for dementia awareness, emphasizing the need for compassionate care. And last but not least, I'd like to introduce Ian Stewart. So he's a devoted caregiver to his mother, who has been support he's been supporting since 2017. So despite facing misconceptions from close family and dealing with the challenges of caregiving, Ian remains committed to providing the best care for his mother. As an openly gay man, Ian brings a unique perspective to the dementia caregiving community, advocating for broader representation and support for the LGBTQ2S plus community facing dementia. 
So thank you so much for all of you being here today and sharing your stories with us. It means so much. Um, and I truly want to thank all of our lived experience partners across the province for being here. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so that we can see our guest speakers. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, so for those that are tuning in, we've invited our guest speakers here today uh, truly to share their experiences, um, both partnering with the Alzheimer's Society, but also how they've benefited from other meaningful engagement opportunities and how that's brought meaning uh, to them along the dementia journey. And so to begin, I think it would be really nice just to uh, learn a little bit more about each of you and how you first kind of got connected with the Alzheimer's Society and why you're interested in partnering with the society. So um, Jim, if you don't mind uh, starting with you, if you'd just like to tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of what brought you to the society. Sure, thanks, uh, Kim. But first of all, I uh, just congratulations to you and the society on this lived experience partner program. It's a huge st uh, step forward for the society and for those of us with the living experience with dementia. And for that, I thank you. Thank but you. I, um, I am an advocate. I'm a researcher and dare I say influencer, not in the TikTok way, but um, being visible in the community, um, talking to people. And that hopefully gets people thinking of dementia in a new way, one of possibilities and capabilities. But I've been active with the society since uh, the fall of 2007, when I attended um, uh, my first event, a public policy forum. And uh, then the following year, I was uh, uh, elected to the board. Um, for a six year term. And of course, as you said, I am back on, um, on the board. Um, but, you know, between then and now, I have had the privilege of being involved in and being a part of really some amazing opportunities. And I've, I've had the honor to, to see the society grow and, and, uh, and mature and, and uh, um, really raise the awareness of, of people with dementia in the community. And um, I so appreciate being, have being a part of some of these um, initiatives and uh, being able to contribute. And I've learned a lot over the years. And, and um, as I say, I, uh, hope that the community at large better understands dementia uh, a lot better than they did in 2007 and 2008. But I support the society because the society is, is dementia, is, uh, represents those of us living with dementia, those of us uh, who have caregivers and family and friends and the society provides the first link helpline. They provide education opportunities, and all of that together is uh, taking a lot of support from from the theoretical into the practical, and uh, and I think uh, and that's why I do all I can to to support the society. Thank you so much, Jim. I think I can speak on behalf of everybody here, um, how much you've contributed to the, the society's growth and um, all the constructive feedback that you have offered throughout the years to really help us get to this place where we are able to provide more opportunities um, for people living with dementia to not only get involved, but to have um, true decision-making power and really be engaged in all that we're, we're doing here at the society. And, and I appreciate um, you for being part of that, that growth. So thank you. Um, 
Granville, uh, thank you for being here with us today. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us and uh, it'd be great just to hear a little bit about um, who you are and uh, what kind of brought you to the society. Thank you, Kim. Thanks for inviting me. And I'm, it means a lot to be, be part of this. And I'm, I really feel honored that, you ha that, that you've allowed me to be here. The, um, I became, I was diagnosed in 2011, more or less. And I became, uh, I spent, of course, the first year or so in, in um, confusion and, uh, and negative responses to, to the realities of, of having a terminal disease. And during that, uh, so during that time, it became clear that I had to find a way of uh, figuring out how to get through this. And with my wife, we went, went, went Google shopping and we found that a BC Alzheimer's Society was having a workshop for um, people living with dementia and their care partners that was taking place once a month, once a week for a month. So, and it just timely, it turned out it was just timely that we could sign up for that and we did attend. And I, I tend to live a, a I do tend, do live, tend to live a, a, a reclusive lifestyle. So, but uh, when I joined that, that group, uh, it first gave me a sense of a community in, in the dementia world that I found very enlightening and um, um, enhancing and started learning a lot about what was going on inside my head and inside my body, inside my, my sense of self. So uh, as being a long-term lifelong artist, those, those feelings that start to translate into, into my art. I did a video, created a, I do, digital collage, and I created a video based on my feelings of having the, the, the new diagnosis. And uh, I, I shared it with, with Laurie DeCrew, who was leading the, the uh, support group. And uh, she, she liked it. And I, um, I, uh, then I began to share it publicly. And it, that sense of community with the, within the dementia world, as I call it, has only grown. And it's given me a new insights into um, not only how I am in living with dementia, but how others are and how, I, how perhaps I can help them and be helped in time, in turn. And that's, that has turned into uh, self-advocacy and, then, and then, uh, in, then external advocacy. So it's a it's a new world for me, but I'm I'm happy to be in it, and it's rich and it's growing, and I think we all, we, all of us living with dementia and our care partners, are here to learn how to be ourselves within within this within our various aspects of dementia, and uh, and uh, the the uh, various parts of the journey that we're going through. Thank you so much for sharing that, Granville, and uh, just always grateful for, for you being here and sharing your insights with us. And um, I think uh, that learning bit that you spoke about, learning about the disease and coming to a better understanding can be very helpful when first navigating things. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Jerry, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit um, from you as well. Just uh, who are you, Jerry, and what brought you to the Alzheimer's Society? Well, uh, my history is in mostly nursing and nursing of older adults. And so throughout my lifetime, I had various positions working in, in education and policy regarding seniors' services and support. And I had a beautiful husband and we traveled a lot and did many things through our married life together. And my husband was a bright, capable senior naval officer and very much in command of things. And so it was always just such a natural relationship we had together. 
until on one occasion in our sailboat, my husband showed me that he was having difficulty and he couldn't find the depth sounder. So for anyone who sails, the depth sounder is a fixed piece of equipment in the cockpit of the, sh of the boat that tells you how deep the water is under your keel. So you're not gonna run aground. He'd been sailing since he was nine. And that moment for me was a stunning revelation about the possibility that my husband was losing his memory. And so I realized we might be on a journey together. And we indeed were on a journey together. This man who was so bright and capable began to lose uh, his way. He was downtown one day and lost his way and came to my office and looked for me to help him find his way home. But you know, I want to thank the people that are here today on the webinar, because this is a wonderful way for sharing and learning about others' experiences. And while we're all on a separate journey, it's unique for each of us, there's a common bond among us. And by reaching out and sharing with others, it's comfortable to know that we have a network through this wonderful Alzheimer's Society. And in my history as a, a, a policy person with government, I knew about the Alzheimer's Society from its infancy in the 90s with Barbara Lindsay, who was then developing the very first dementia strategy for the Alzheimer's Society. And so when Peter became, when I became aware that Peter was losing his memory, the first thing I did was to reach out to the society to say, how can you help? How can I, what can I do? And the support and the comfort and the tremendous help I received has just made me committed to the organization all this time. And since Peter died in 2008, I've just been connected to the Alzheimer's Society in any way that I can. Thank you so much, Sherry. And I know it was probably not a journey that you had planned to take, but I am grateful that it brought you to us and um, all the work that you have contributed to the Alzheimer's Society. And um, yeah, I'm always grateful for you sharing your story. So thank you for being here today. I'm pleased to be here. Thank you. Um, Ian, would you mind sharing a little bit about yourself? Um, kind of what first connected you to the society and, and why you wanted to get involved? Hi, guys. Uh, so my experience, I, I was overseas. I, I lived many years in the United Kingdom. Uh, I'm from Canada, but, but I moved there and was working there. I worked actually for a period of time at Canada House uh, in London. Um, and uh, uh, both my mom and my dad were getting older uh, and starting to have difficulties. My, my younger brother brought my dad actually to London to visit. And and it was kind of really apparent that, oh, you know, something's kind of going on here. Um, and so uh, through that, uh, I, 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 we kind of identified, okay, you know, there's a, there's a dementia aspect happening here. And in the United Kingdom, they have the Nationalized Health Service, as we have in Canada. They have Nationalized Health, the NHS. Uh, and in the NHS, they'd identified that... Um, uh, caregivers were uh, at, at greater risk of having health impacts than the general population, which was a big impact on the uh, on the health medical system in the United Kingdom. But additionally, uh, that caregivers were saving billions and billions of pounds to the National Health Service in the United Kingdom because they were uh, caring for their loved ones at home as opposed to more costly uh, institutional settings and so on. So. Um, uh, through that, the National Health Service uh, contracted out nationwide in Britain a training program that was uh, called Caring with Confidence, and it's it's maybe similar to the uh, uh, the Alzheimer's Society's uh, uh, caregiving in, uh, initial program for people that are uh, learning about dementia. The uh, I, I, the name has just gone out of my head of the uh, of the Alzheimer's Society. Uh, uh, program for we have, uh, shaping uh, the journey um, and the, the family caregiver series or both. family caregiver series is what I'm thinking yeah the family caregiver series so so uh, in Britain they rolled out this program nationwide and there was uh, it was targeted to various different communities of course and so there was a specific program for gay men uh, 
uh, in London, because gay men very often are uh, are uh, being caregivers in their families, uh, and as any uh, LGBT person would be in their family. Um, so uh, uh, I, I went to this uh, program anticipating that okay, both my mom and my dad were get, or something's going on, and we're going to be having uh, having uh, uh, care requirements. And so this little program, it was a, a you know a few hours on a Saturday. Uh, I think it was four or five Saturdays in a row where we had a little bit of training and just, you know, about taking care of yourself and about how to advocate for your, your loved one and very basic stuff that, again, they, they, they had this really useful training program that was just sort of the basics of caregiving. And part of that training was that uh, when your loved one is afflicted by whatever malady, there's probably going to be a society that's involved uh, with uh, uh, that, that's lobbying for it and doing uh, education and so on. So they said, like, you know, read up on the on the uh, condition and find out about it and engage with the society that's there because they're going to be the forefront of developments on what you want to be happening for your loved one. So uh, uh, as the condition uh, got more complicated for my mom and my dad, I moved back to Canada to assist with uh, caregiving for my mom and dad. Uh, uh, I was staying at my dad's house and uh, uh, was caring for him for a period of time uh, until my, my dad passed away in uh, 2017. Uh, uh, so uh, went through the dementia journey, um, uh, was in a care home uh, at, uh, at the end, had really great, amazing care. And uh, he was in Victoria at that time. Uh, and then in parallel with that, my mom was starting to have increasing care needs, so um, I moved into my mom's place. So I'm uh, involved right now uh, with the care of my mom. I have two brothers, a younger brother and an older brother, who uh, also participate as well. And uh, so that's that's what brought me into the orbit of the uh, of the Alzheimer's Society, the family caregiver series I did on the Sunshine Coast uh, where we were living at the time. Uh, wonderful series that I really strongly recommend for people. Uh, and uh, then subsequent training programs uh, as we've gone along have been really helpful, um, particularly dealing with grief. Uh, as you're grieving kind of the losses maybe that uh, might be uh, apparent along the journey and uh, you know various subjects like that that uh, are kind of specialized to uh the situation in our day-to-day -day lives so so that's uh that's that's my role of in involvement coming into the uh, alzheimer's society thank you so much ian um i see a common thread through what um all of you have shared around the, the benefit of, of education and, and as well as connecting to a, a greater community um, and feeling part of something. And there's so much value in that. Um, and I'm really glad that, that all of you found your way um, to connect with us and have um, given back in so many ways by sharing your story, um, which I know will resonate with many people tuning in today. And uh, I want to talk a little bit more about meaningful engagement and, and the benefits of, of those opportunities. So we, we started off talking about why it's important that we offer meaningful engagement opportunities um, for people who have been impacted by dementia. And one of the things that we do hear quite frequently, both from people uh, living with dementia and caregivers, is that Upon a diagnosis, it can bring about so much change and it can be a blow to one's self-confidence um, where people may be losing some of their roles or those roles are looking different than they once were. Um, and for people supporting someone living with dementia, that might be an addition of new roles and just a lot of change that can ha sometimes have an impact where you feel like you're losing a bit of control. Um, and also your self-identity and sometimes. And so with all of that, that change, it can lead people to sometimes withdraw um, or step back or step away from activities. Um, and we've heard from others that people have stepped away from them and their life as well. And social isolation can be a, a real challenge, um, particularly depending on where you're living in the province, it can be a, a greater, have a greater impact on some, uh, as well as feelings of grief and loss and, and everything that comes with walking this journey. And it's not one that we would want anybody to walk alone. And we know that staying involved um, and engaged in purposeful activity can help um, people cope with some of those changes. 
And so um, I'd love to hear from, from all of you how you've personally benefited from meaningful engagement opportunities. They may have come from your work with the Alzheimer's Society, but they may have come from other avenues as well. Um, so what is meaningful engagement meant to you and how has it benefited you? Um, Jerry, is it okay? I'll start with, with you. Okay. You know, I, I spoke earlier about the fact that I had known about the Alzheimer's Society. And so once we had a diagnosis, Peter and I, I felt that I wanted to reach out to them, that I felt I needed, even with my background and experience in healthcare uh, and seniors, that I needed some support. And I think the most important thing is to be able to reach out, that we know that there's a safe place to talk about it. And the Alzheimer's Society has done that for so long. And I can't say enough about the society and the wonderful people who are there and the volunteers who agree to come along and, and help us through some of these difficult uh, stages of, of our journey. But when Peter was first diagnosed, there was an offer from the Victoria Society to uh, have Peter join an early stage group. And so I thought, well, this is wonderful. He will share with others who are in a similar situation that he's in. He was always very open about his illness. He spoke about it. He spoke about it publicly. He spoke about it to friends. He encouraged others to talk about it. And so I thought he'd be having a wonderful time in an early stage group talking with other people uh, that were experiencing some of the things that he was. In the meantime, I drove him to the early stage group and I thought, well, there's not enough time to go home and come back. I'll stay in the lobby. Well, what I discovered was that there were about 10 or 11 other people driving their loved ones to the early stage group. And we all ended up in the lobby waiting for our loved one to finish his, his or her, uh, her session. So the first time in the lobby, we kind of said hello to each other and we had magazines and books and we were kind of, and the second time we were there, the week later, we started to talk together and we started to share some of our experiences together. And the bond started to form with this group, with shared experience, even though each journey is unique, there were common threads that ran through and we formed the Victoria Alzheimer's Society Lobby Support Group. And we had those weeks of, of talking and sharing and, and, uh, and, and we got to the place where we were willing to share really difficult stories and some very profound events that had happened in our life with our loved one and the Alzheimer journey. And so, we stayed as friends after that. We connected with each other in a way that was so meaningful through a great deal of the time that I had Peter with me for 10 years. And I, I, I think that that's a, a most sort of valuable kind of experience, that sharing and finding others and the bond that gets formed because we have a common, uh, we have a common concern, common love of our person. And, and we need to be able to find a safe place to talk about it. And the Alzheimer's Society provided that for us. Thank you, Jerry. Um, yeah, I can't speak enough about the, the power of having others who are experiencing what you're experiencing, just to have them in your corner, to, to build your network. Um, and have somebody you can go to, you know, if you're having a bad day. And you know, the other thing is that often another person may have had a similar experience and has a solution or has things to suggest to make it easier. And so it was that, that sort of network and relationship and in the helping sort of relationship that was so valuable for all of us. So much uh, shared knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um. Ian, uh, I'd like to ask you the, the same question, just how you have personally benefited from uh, meaningful engagement opportunities in your life. 
uh, very similar to uh, to Jerry's experience. You know that um, uh, uh, support good groups in general, but uh, particularly with the Alzheimer's Society, we have a LGBT support group. Or a, a, I, I don't know the acronym now. It might be Two uh, S LGBTQ or uh, what have you. We we have a differing letters now for lesbian and gay and bisexual transgender people, uh, and various uh, uh, different definitions that people might have of themselves. Um, but the Alzheimer's Society had uh, started in Vancouver, uh, an LGBT support group. Um, and so at the time I was involved with caring for my dad. Uh, he was living in Gibson's where we'd all grown up at our family home. Uh, and uh, my mom was in Vancouver. She'd uh, separated and divorced from my dad many years earlier, had a second husband who had passed away. My mom was living in Vancouver. And so coming and going between these locations, I, I'd be able to stomp off in Vancouver for these uh, LGBT support group meetings, uh, which were, were, were hugely uh, uh, important because lesbian and gay people in our societies, people are probably generally aware you know we have a, a, a sometimes a tough path you know with uh, uh, all kinds of things thrown at us um, there's a big campaign right now that's uh, uh, ongoing where people are being bombarded with disinformation about lesbian and gay people uh, so through all of that you know you, you have extra sort of barriers that get in the way and so to be able to be with other lesbian and gay people who are uh, caring for their loved ones, uh, I, you know, I'm involved with my parents. We had people in the group who would be involved with their parents. But over the time, you know, the group is changing over many times. We had a lot of people uh, caring for their loved ones, their partners, um, some of whom f are from the days when their relationship was illegal and they weren't allowed to be married and had to be secret and so on you know so uh I, also with trans people you know uh, uh people who had transitioned very very you know decades ago and um uh came out of the process with just all kinds of concerns about the, the medical profession and then you know uh, uh having dementia as a trans person you know it's it's a it's a uh a, a whole extra ball game of, uh, of uh, complications that you have there. Um, uh, so I, uh, just for, for, for myself, I found that that was very helpful to be with other gay men and lesbians who uh, are, are part of my normal kind of social circle in this, this new uh, caregiving uh, setting. Um, uh, additionally, though, I'd like to flag just support groups in general for anyone. If, if there's anybody listening today who... Uh, uh, is thinking about it. Sometimes there might be a bit of a wait list to get into a support group. Uh, the Alzheimer's Society has the LGBT support group, which is province-wide. It's an online support group, uh, which you can join by phone if you're not using the computer. Um, uh, uh, so we do have always people and from all over the province. We have people that are, uh, that are participating uh, uh, by phone or by computer. Um, but also the in-person support groups or other online support groups uh, they, they, it's really helpful just for all the reasons, as Jerry says, you know, that uh, people have tips or things that have been successful for what's worked with them. Um, you're going through different stages of a lengthy journey, and so people will be at different places on the journey. You get an aspect of what's coming next. Uh, and, and overall, I find that really helpful. I find that uh, I'm always amazingly boosted when I get to go. Uh, you know, you have a moan about, oh, you know, these these things going on in one's life that uh, are so complicated. Uh, it, uh, it's, it's been hugely helpful having uh, having the Alzheimer's Society on board with this. So, so yeah, so the LGBT support group has been, been a really powerful, powerful link for me. Thank you for sharing that, Ian. And I'm, I'm glad you're able to find a, a safe place to, to, to speak about your experiences, free from judgment, and um, connect with others who truly get what you're going through. So, And thank you for being an advocate for that group and, and raising awareness. I think that's so important. Um, Granville, uh, I'd love to hear from you a little bit about how meaningful engagement opportunities have brought um, some positivity into your life or benefited you in, in ways? Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I've always been an outlier in society, um, whether black society or white society or any of the other colors. I've always felt that um, it didn't, that, uh, that uh, acceptance was, a, was um, 
hard, cut hard reality to come by. And in and in the uh, since I've been involved with uh, advocacy, um, I've also discovered that, in fact, there is a, there is a a growing community of of advocates, professionals. In, I'm speaking of now. The um, the uh, oh God, I'm forgetting the name already. I was all ready to say it and it went. Uh, the the national, um, the, the national dimension, of, the national dementia guideline group uh, is a group of um, a working group of five, uh, six professionals, and, and and myself. They're all uh, they're all black females, uh, five doctors and a uh, and a uh, a prison guard. And we've been developing guidelines, national guidelines, for 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 um, spe specifically focusing on the uh, black community and the uh, the the reality of going through the the, the dementia diagnosis, as well as uh, the po pre pre diagnosis and po post diagnosis developing guidelines for the medical professionals and other medical other medical support groups to to specifically deal with the realities of the black community because uh, it is the stigma in a black community is also prevalent with dealing with racism besides ageism and sexism it's is one of many isms so the Black community is very reticent to come out and and reveal themselves as a person living with dementia or even a care person living with someone with dementia. So we try to break down the bad the barrier the barriers to those to those um, their involvement and and there let them know that it is safe harbor to to expose them that their vulnerability within the general population because there will be support specifically uh, uh, tailored to their needs. And this has been, a, been a, one of my cause, cause celebs because in all, most of the groups that I've been in outside of that particular group, I've been the only black person involved and I remain so. So it's, it's um, the, it, it is a similar situation to the with the Chinese community. There's a very different world as far as living with dementia within the Chinese world. And I've had some association with them through the Alzheimer's Society of Canada in their work in their working groups that are specifically focused on the Chinese community. And that I've also co-authored co a paper with Karen Wong for uh, the inter 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 ah uh, inter uh, inter connection. I can't think of the specific. I can't remember the specific title, but it's about the inter connectivity between the uh, black between people of color and with racism, sexism, and and um is and dementia stigma. Mm -hmm. So that that project was was huge uh, to working with Karen Wong and with the with the uh, Deborah I can't again I can't think of the, the doctor's name uh, she's a good friend but I can't remember her name at the moment uh, working on developing that paper was has been a huge a learning curve for me. Uh, even though I am a writer, working with her has been really, really a positive experience to to develop something along those lines that connects many different cultures together, finding their common ground and how we can best uh, support each other in in our in the journeys that we're dealing with within the general society. So the uh, so it's been a cultural. Um, uh, I'm, 
discovered a cultural ri richness that I had not known before. And um, the BC Alzheimer's has been a par large part of that, along with, of course, the, the uh, Alzheimer's Society of Canada. Thank you, Granville. I, I appreciate you speaking about that work. I think it's so important um, to, to raise awareness. And we talk about stigma and discrimination that people living with dementia face, but there's so many layers um, that can be put on top of that, depending on your background, where you live in the province, um, what community you're coming from. And so I, I really appreciate both you and Ian being here and, and creating talking about some of that diversity because it is a goal with the lived experience partner program to um, bring more awareness and offer a platform for more diverse stories. So thank you. Um, Jim, I, I'd like to ask you a similar question just about how meaningful engagement opportunities have been a positive in your life. They have been uh, a big positive and, and a lot of them have been learning opportunities uh, for me, um, but um, some some of the learn some of the lessons uh, I've been able to to use in other situations, and and uh, that will hopefully benefit so many more people. Uh, but through my start at the society, um, uh, I um, got a bit more involved uh, nationally and, and with uh, was on the board of the Alzheimer's Society of Canada. But, um, and over the years, the uh, opportunities, whether they be local or, or national, have been um, some that have been absolutely uh, well come out of nowhere in my mind but uh, uh, whoever thought I'd be speaking about dementia in front of the art gallery in Vancouver um, uh, but uh, on a cold winter day actually but um, uh, I was able, you know, I was uh, uh, appointed to the Ministerial Advisory Board on Dementia a few years ago. And um, that group of, of uh, 14 people uh, on the board um, actually worked with the Public Health Agency of Canada. And uh, in 2019, the National Dementia Strategy was issued. Um, and um, I, uh, through a lot of these lessons, have been a part of research um, and actually been author or co-author of 52 papers in, uh, in, in research, but it's all been focused around quality of life uh, research and, and uh, um, uh, technology and and uh, uh, hopefully that that little bit of research um, knowledge is spread out or the the outcomes of the research is spread to other communities and and uh, uh, so that we see um, benefits elsewhere and certainly um, one project that uh, I was, I was co-investigator on and Gramble was a part of it, um, produced a toolkit that is now being accessed around the world. And, and that to me is, is absolutely, uh, well, I'm over the moon over it because you realize that people in, you know, Africa or, or in Eastern Europe or wherever, are are perhaps gaining more um, knowledge, firsthand knowledge about living with dementia. Um, that um, you know, in a lot of cases, they may not have any insight before they've read it, and and so I I just um, I value the opportunities I've had over the years. So. 
you so much for sharing that, Jim. Um, each of you, you know, talked about different experiences, but um, all comes back to that purposeful activity um, and finding your passions and having a way to to express that and get it out to people. And I know that all of your um, works and efforts and the research that you've been part of has, um, like Jim said, even reach people all over the world, um, mm -hmm. which has such a profound impact and will shape people's journeys for, for many years to come. And I, I appreciate you sharing kind of what's been meaningful and purposeful for you. And I'd like to go back to the question that we asked um, our viewers at the beginning about what gave them purpose and, and highlight a, a few things that people have, have shared. Um, and we hear that uh, family um, and involvement with the Alzheimer's Society has given uh, some people a sense of purpose. Um, walks, nature, engaging in hobbies, uh, which I think is so Im important to have those outlets. Um, ensuring that my mom feels uh, cared for and safe. Um, so that that role in, in caregiving and that gift that we can give um, others, I think is so purposeful. Um, giving back by supporting current caregivers, which which many of you are are doing, and so I, I appreciate many of the the sentiments that have been shared in, in the chat box around uh, chat box around what gives um, each of you you purpose, and um, yeah, and I just want to continue to reinforce that that message that if you're looking for other ways uh, to get involved um, to engage in some of the activities that that Jim and Granville and Jerry and, and Ian have been speaking about please uh, connect with us because we are excited to bring on new voices and, and new faces uh, to share their story um, and advocate. And so I, I think at, at this uh, point in time, it would be nice to hear from um, our panelists who have been so actively involved in, in so many uh, different ways, uh, a little bit more about some of the specific opportunities that people can uh, take part in if they uh, want to get involved with the lived experience partner program. Um, one of those opportunities I mentioned at the beginning is uh, an opportunity for for artists. And that doesn't mean a professional artists, it means anybody who is looking for a creative outlet or a platform to share what you've been working on. We'd love to connect with you um, and learn more. And so Granville, um, I know that you have such a passion for, for advocacy and for sharing your journey, not just your dementia journey, but, but your life through art, music and writing. And I'm just wondering if you have anything you'd like to share with those listening in um, who might be uh, looking to, to use art uh, as a way to advocate or express themselves. Sure, happy to. Um, first of all, just, I have a, a Arthur's website. It's called GranvilleJohnson.ca. And you can go there and do what this site is set up to, to uh, give you access to a, a novel that I've just finished. It, it's a first volume of a four volume set. It's called Backstory, The Many Lives of Granville Johnson. I'm also a musician and I've got a, an album called um, The Day Will Come. The, my, my band is called Autumn Rose. And from my website, you can uh, download uh, either my uh, six songs or and or the whole or, or individually or or as a as an album. Huh. So uh, for me, art has has focused, Dimitri, I should say, has helped focus my art. And though my art is not limited to expressing the dementia experience, it has the dementia itself has given me a greater um, determination to express myself as I'm as I'm growing and as, as I'm changing. And that is something I think that anyone, that everyone who has dealing with dementia can use to express themselves, be whatever particular art aspect they may be interested in, be it literary or visual or musical or other activities that, or even in dance. Dance is huge. I used to be a professional dancer. It was one of my first um, artistic uh, endeavors. I trained for four years and danced professionally for 10. 
back in the days <laughs> when I was in my 20s and 30s. So the uh, reality of, of the art is it, it feeds your soul, it feeds your spirit, it feeds your mind, it helps keep you sharp, it helps keep you open, and it helps keep you, or helps, it helps you discover how deep you really are as an individual and how, how much you can contribute to the world around you and to those you love. So I'm, if I have a comment area uh, on my website, if you're interested in, in contacting me and we can talk more about this, it doesn't have to be, have to, anything to do with what I'm actually doing, but I'd be happy to, uh, to connect with you and we can uh, just talk about what you're interested in and, and, how, and how your art is affecting you and those you love. So just uh, go to my website and uh, go to the contact page and there's a comment form there that you can fill out and I'll, I will, I promise to get back to you. Thank you, Granville. I can see you, you just light up when you talk about um, your passion for, for art and music and dance and um, writing. And so I, I think it's so wonderful that you are making, um, just just sharing your story like in those many many different ways and the website uh, is in the chat box so yeah i encourage people to to please connect with granville and thank you for the the offer to also um reach out and be kind of a peer mentor i i know that that's a, important for you as well and so it is um, indeed and i think uh you have an opportunity to share your music at the the walk in prince george is that correct uh, yes, uh, I'll be there to play a few songs, and uh, I play djembe, and I'll be playing my drum and singing a few songs for my album. Lovely. Um, thank you so much. Um, Jim, uh, you've been uh, involved in so many different roles with the Alzheimer's Society, um, potentially almost all of them, but... Uh, <laughs> Today, I, I was hoping you might be able to speak to how the society can support people with lived experience of dementia and connecting with uh, the research community, um, because I know that that's been a really big uh, part of your life. I think you mentioned, was it 53 different articles you, you've been part of, um, supporting and co-writing and leading? And so, uh, and you've also spoken at many of the society's research luncheons where we bring in researchers um, from across BC to, to hear what's important um, from people living with dementia. So if you could speak a little bit about that experience um, and how people might benefit from connecting with the research community. I think it's important to, to, to say that before I was involved in my very first research project as part of one of three uh, advisors, lived experience advisors, and that was in 2010. Um, before then, I really thought research was all microscopes and, and petri dishes and did not realize there was such a, such a thing as quality of life research or psychosocial research. And so I say that because many of the people listening to today may well think, well, you know, I'm not into clinical research. And, and, and it is more than that, uh, which is why I'm, I am a big proponent of, of, getting involved in research, whether uh, it is um, having, you know, working, uh, talking to researchers and answering their questions and, and, and giving them your insight um, that will help the work that they are doing, or, you know, as, as um, to be an advice, one of, one of, of one, uh, one of many advisors uh, for a particular research project that again will provide insight to researchers as they pursue um, their research, whether it be a two-year project or four, whatever. Uh, I always remember being on a on pre-Zoom, so it was a conference call. Um, there were, I think, three people uh, advising this particular project. 
a number of researchers were involved, but um, the conference call was for myself here and in, in, in uh, Vancouver, and uh, there was a person in uh, the Ontario, one in Nova Scotia, and the researchers were all on the line, but had been told not to say anything. But as the three of us were talking, uh, there was there were a couple of times when I heard very quietly in the background, that's an interesting perspective. Or, you know, I'd not thought of it that, in that way. And it just reinforced to me how much what value we we actually uh, give to the researcher, to the research project. And um, and I think the society uh, can play and does play a role in 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 matching uh, people with lived experience and and researchers. I think there is uh, a section on the website where you can actually register and um, uh, and show some you know something of interest of yours that. Uh, another researcher may re may read and realize that you would be ideal for the work that they are doing. Um, and uh, I have learned so much over the years as I have been an advisor to a PhD candidate and I've been uh, ad uh, advising other projects and and Latterly, the principal co-invest or co-principal investigator of a project, uh, and they've all been a learning experience for me. But they've also been, uh, I hope, uh, providing insight that re some researchers would not have had otherwise. No, absolutely. I think it's so important for research to have that firsthand connection and. Um knowledge of people who are living with the disease as, as well as um, caregiver, the caregiver voice uh, and that to, to be part of even the planning of the, the questions when they're, they're thinking about how are we going to approach researching this subject and from the very beginning involving um, people living with dementia in, in a meaningful way and how much more enriching that, that research can be at the end. And we've, we've seen many examples of that, including the, the flipping stigma work um, that Jim and Granville were uh, a big part of. And so if, if anyone is interested in, um, yeah, in exploring um, what it might look like to partner uh, with researchers in your community and participate in quality of life research, um, like Jim said, we can, we can help um, make those connections, which uh, is a nice way to get involved. All mm -hmm. right, um, Jerry, I'm going to turn uh, it over to you uh, to talk a little bit about your experience. You've, you've shared with us previously um, a meaningful event when you and Peter were a walk on a reef. Uh, so just before I do that, I just want to say to Jim and Granville, thank you so much for all the contributions you've made. Uh, and it's so important that we hear the voices of those people experiencing the disease and and their care partners and um, each journey is unique and so you've brought all of your experiences to to advancing the information and knowledge that we can share with others who come to us uh, now so thank you for that and um, I just also wanted to say before I tell this little story is that we need to remember that we are still the same person and that sometimes we forget that when we're frustrated or anxious and, and we just have to go back to what we knew about our loved one before, how they were, and try and accommodate sometimes to that, the changes and, and, and that things that are familiar, have been familiar to them, can sometimes make a big difference uh, when there's anxiety or frustration or difficulty. So um, I just want to talk a little bit about the Walk for Memories in the year 2004. Uh, Peter was the honoree for the Walk for Memories here in Victoria. Now, Peter was a very outgoing man. He was um, 
I, I used to call him a Renaissance man because he was so interested in everything. He played the violin, he read, he, he was outgoing, and he wanted everyone to know about this disease, his own experience and also drawing in other people to him. And he, in order to, to do this walk for memories, he did television interviews and we had the cameras in our home. And, um, and at that particular time, this walk was held in January, which was like the coldest month. So Peter and I sat down and we decided we were going to make this a real celebration, not just of Peter, but of all the people in Victoria and their caregivers. So we really wanted to go public. Well, because Peter had been in the Navy and retired as the base commander, we managed to get the Jeep in which we put all the possible people with Alzheimer's that we knew. We got the maiden band and we got into the University of Victoria and we had a wonderful march and walk all around the, the university. And we made it a very big celebration, celebration of life uh, as we all knew it at that moment. And Peter was one of the youngest Canadians to command a landing craft on D-Day. And he took uh, soldiers into Bernier-sur-Mer in France. And, and so he, he wanted to reflect, I think, in some way, the Canadian experience and just one section of our world that can be so affected by this, uh, by this disease. So it was a, a memorable day. And I think we had, oh, I don't know how many hundreds of people all walking around that ring road. And I guess it's, it truly was a celebration, but it also was about Peter being that person he'd always been but with the kinds of changes that prevented him from being involved and as active as he always was before. So I think we, we do need to keep our, our sort of stability about, about life as we experience it. And for each one of us, it's a unique, uh, a unique story. And so I just leave you with the idea that, um, and you know, for me, before I go there, for me now, the committee part of it, the work, not the way Granville and uh, Jim have done it, but very personally, I get calls from many people, uh, calls maybe once a week, someone saying, you know, I've heard that you are a person that's experienced this. Can you help us? Can we, do you know how to do this or what we can do here? And I am so happy to be able to support people and uh, help them with issues and concerns that they might have. So my committee work is with uh, Kim and it's also with Jim. And I'm delighted to be part of the process of building this lived experience involvement with the society. And so thank you for having me today. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you for telling the the story. That sounds like such an unbelievable day, and I wish I was <laughs> present was, to to witness it. it um, was lots of fun, and you know what? The whole thing about this too is that sometimes, in the middle of the grief and the anxiety, there are funny things that happen, and we mustn't forget. We have to have that balance. We have to look for the balance so that we can experience even the joy of going through some things that uh, are difficult. Yeah, it's true. Absolutely. Um, the, the walk, uh, the IG Wealth Management Walk for Alzheimer's is um, one of my favorite events that, that we host throughout the year because I think it truly does engage the community. Um, it's intergenerational. We see families coming together. Um, I've heard one of my colleagues refer to it as a family reunion because we get to see people from all sorts of programs that maybe we we haven't caught up uh, with in a long time. And it's just so wonderful to see so many people come out. And you, when you're in a park or in a public place, people who are just there enjoying it are coming and asking what's going on and they're learning uh, about dementia and they're seeing such a, a large group come out um, to honor 
those that have been impacted by the disease. So it is a great event. I, I encourage you, if you haven't been part of it, um, you can go on our website and, and check if there's a walk in your community. There are 19 walks across uh, the province and it is no longer in January, I'm happy to say. Um, <laughs> it's now in May, which fingers crossed can be a little bit warmer, but um, this year's walk will be Sunday, May 26th, and you can visit walkforalzheimers.ca to register and also to read the stories of the walk honorees in your community because um, it's really about honoring uh, the people. And that's such a lovely um, part of it as well. And if you're in Prince George, you have the added benefit of getting to listen to Granville's music as well. So. And see him dance. <laughs> <laughs> So that's an extra uh, an extra draw if you're on the fence. Uh, definitely <laughs> worth coming out. Um, and Ian, uh, you were um, an Alzheimer's Awareness Month spokesperson um, in 2023. You've talked already a little bit about um, the importance of, of bringing awareness to the LGBTQ2S plus uh, support group um, and really sharing your story in the hopes to bring broader representation into the dementia community. Is there anything you'd like to share about that experience being uh, an Awareness Month spokesperson? Sure, yeah, I, I was thinking about this as the other others have been uh, speaking uh, of, of their experience. And the thing that I've, I've thought maybe to highlight here is how, uh, Kim, you've been a great uh, help for us and um, just the society in general that, uh, you know, for for the uh, awareness month, uh, I, I was interviewed on the radio for CBC. They uh, they uh, sent somebody uh, round. We 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 met at uh, the Alzheimer's Society's downtown Vancouver office, uh, and um, uh, worked with this journalist. She asked questions. We were responding, and then uh, they edited it together to make a uh, a little radio piece uh, that was on the early edition on the uh, CBC radio, and. You know, it's not kind of a common thing that I do, right? You know, going on the radio or what have you. So it was, it was, uh, I've been sort of helped to go through all of these steps to where, like, as with the seminar now, you know, I'm, I'm just at home, uh, speaking with the, with peers on this. And, um, uh, I, I think the society can really bring you along if you wanted to get more involved with the lived experience program. Um, uh, you know, again, I, I, wasn't particularly skilled or anything special for for going on the radio but uh, uh it was a possibility that came up that uh, somebody was needed and sure you know i can i can try that and you're encouraged along the way so you're learning kind of new things and engaging in different uh, things that may be may be different but it's uh it's uh so helpful to have you know professional staff who know what they're doing who are you know guiding you along and and in, uh, in the process so that's kind of my main reflection uh, uh, on that, I think that, uh, uh, and as for, for today's seminar, you know, here we're a panel, and beforehand we met with Kimberly and uh, met online and sort of discussed how the shape of this uh, this uh, panel would be presented and so on. So it, it, you feel pretty comfortable, you know, to be able to uh, to go out and uh, and say your piece, you know, say what's uh, what's your experience, and. Uh, I think that's a, a great thing to be involved with, especially you know here in the in the whirl of of sort of uh, caregiving, which is my day to day, uh, uh, plunking down and having these little opportunities to uh, speak about it. I, I think contribute to, in a in a way, and then you feel good for that. You know, you're feeling that you're uh, you're able to contribute positively to uh, to uh, uh, where other people are, and hopefully again bring others others on board to uh, to be involved. Uh, more with the with these opportunities thank you for sharing that ian and uh, it's something i'm very excited about with this uh the new lived experience partner program is the the flexibility and the additional support um that we can provide so uh, all of you today are very public facing with your stories um and i want to let people know that are listening it, you, you don't if you're not comfortable yet um, engaging in that way there are other opportunities um, to share your perspectives and your experiences uh, as well so there's there's a lots of support available and, and ways to get involved um, and yeah we encourage you to reach out um, we have just a few minutes left and there's a couple questions in the chat box is it okay with with the group if I um, 
ask yeah. one of them. Um, so of course. two people have um, highlighted that specifically for caregiving, but I think this could apply for anybody who's been affected by dementia, that there can be really hard times. Um, sometimes people can experience even depression along this journey. And what helps you get through those hard times? Um, I'll just open it up if anyone would like to share. I, I, I've been watching the chat, uh, Kim, and all of you that are here today. And I hope I have not made light of the tremendous difficulties and grief and sadness we feel when we're caring for someone. I understand all of those things very, very well and over a long period of time. And one of the things that I learned as a caregiver was that I needed to share with others that I needed a network around me, good friends, people who knew Peter and I well. And I had a few names on that list. And if I really got to that place where I felt I just wasn't coping very well, I would call one of them and say, could you come for an hour or two hours and stay with Peter? I need to go for a walk or I need to have help. And on one occasion I fell and had to go to emergency and I had this little list and the top people on the list, when I phoned them, they came and stayed with Peter while I went to emerge and got my wrist patched up. It's a very helpful thing to know there are people around you that understand and care that you may really need someone to come so that you can take a break, get away, Get your balance back and uh, and maybe talk to someone uh, if you have a support person or someone at the society uh, that could just help you get through it. So it's one suggestion that I have that was very helpful to me. Thank you, Jerry. Would anyone else like to speak to that question, mm -hmm. kind of what gets you through the hard times? I, I, I just come in with a pitch for the Dementia Helpline, which is a really good resource. You know, you can phone them, uh, I, I, I guess, is it Monday through Friday, Kim? I'm not sure of the, Monday through the actual hours. Yeah, but the uh, I've, I've many's the time, you know, I've called either, whether there's some crisis at the moment or uh, something that's kind of you're working on. Uh, and it's very, very worthwhile to call. And I, I, I further would uh, make a pitch for the uh, the First Link uh, Dementia Helpline, the First Link program, which is relatively new, where the society uh, is making outreach to people. Um, we have them call, I don't know, not that long ago here, they, they call every now and again, you know, and say oh how are things going and and uh, actually I'd had, I'd had a written out list of uh these things that i've been meaning to call the dementia helpline and hadn't gotten to and so I was, I was able to talk to this person who made the outreach to speak to us and be able to speak about that and and work through these these various different things you know that were uh, uh getting professional advice it was really really helpful for me for uh, for having that um Self-care is uh, is a, a, an important strand through all of this, and I think that um, uh, actually, I think Jerry was using this example before about uh, when you're in the uh, plane and the the oxygen masks drop, and you have to put your mask on first before you assist your 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 one who's with you, uh, and I think that's. Uh, important through all of this uh, journey that you have to be really carving out the time which is difficult to do to care for yourself um i've been fortunate this uh, this last while we've had my brother staying with me i've been able to uh staying with me, me and my mom here that i've been able to go out most days i get out for a walk and i go out to our local urban forest and troop around in the trees and it's it's done wonders for me it really has uh, been a huge uh, uh saving grace to uh, be able to get outdoors and be in nature and just sort of away and trooping about for a little while uh, physical exercise uh so i found that has been has been really helpful for those those tough times which are are daily you know you have uh, all kinds of uh stuff that's going on and and that we're not familiar with you know what do we do now you know things that out of the blue uh and so it's it's good again to be able to have outreach but it's also important to be taking care of oneself as best as one can no, absolutely and I, and i'd like to point out if your question didn't get answered today the dementia helpline is a wonderful resource and 
having that one-to-one -one support where they can walk you through your personal situation, um, as well as receiving the outreach calls through the First Link program. Um, all right, we only have a few minutes left. We filled the 90 minutes quite quickly. Um, but is there a final parting word that um, anyone of our panelists would like to share? Um, maybe to somebody on the call who's thinking about becoming a lived experience partner um, or an advocate uh, and sharing their stories. So is there anything you'd like to say to them? Just do it. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Thanks, so, Thanks Joe. <laughs> so much courage and love and care. And um, I think we know how difficult it can be. But there's hope. The Alzheimer's Society gives us hope that we can get the support and help that we need. Granville, did you have a, a parting word? Yes, uh, be sure to take advantage of your, your social life outside of your, your, your caretaker role and, um, and try to make it as regular as, as, you, as necessary as, as you can within, within your, your commitment to, your, to the person you're caring for. Because it's, my wife is, um, has made a point, we have made a point of establishing her, 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 her world of her, her social world so she has that on a regular basis and it keeps everything much fresher and also keeps the stress low much lower thank you wonderful parting words um all right before we we bring our webinar to a close i want to uh, again extend a sincere thank you to all of our lived experience partners um, and to each of you, our, our panelists for being here today, um, sharing your story, sharing your experiences. And a thank you to everybody on the call. Um, you're here to learn more about this uh, amazing um, program that we hope um, will bring more voices uh, of lived experience, um, greater awareness and help people get in, involved in a purposeful way where you can really um, shape what we do here at the Alzheimer's Society and how we offer support to people. Um, we truly want to know what matters most um, to you. And so thank you for, for uh, being here today and uh, taking part. And a thank you to all of the society staff across the province who have been allies for this program and supported the work through the committee and um, in other ways. So just a big thank you. And um, yeah, I, I I'm ready to celebrate uh, the launch of the program and um, the wonderful uh, things that we're going to do together. So thank you so much. Um, I don't know why you didn't bring a, a little ribbon oh. and we could have had that uh, little I bit need, of a ribbon cutting. I know, we, <laughs> we need a ribbon cutting. <laughs> All right, so we are um, at the end of our, our presentation. Thank you so much. Um, also, there's the information about the First Link Dementia Helpline that we mentioned, which is available Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, and we also have helplines for the Chinese and South Asian communities available from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And then just uh, a final message, if, if you or someone you know is interested in supporting the society as a lived experience partner, please feel welcome to email me at livedexperience at alzheimerbc.org or go mm -hmm. online and you can fill out that online application uh, to share some, a little bit about yourself and I'll reach out to you and that can be um, found at alzbc.org slash livedexperience. Um, so thank you everyone uh, for being here today.